My pleasure to introduce a distinguished panel of witnesses. The witnesses' written statements will be entered into the record in their entirety. I ask you to please summarize within five minutes or less, considering the size of the witnesses. Um, to help us stay within this uh, time limit, you will notice, the, uh, as my colleague and former chairman of another committee, Mr. Towns, would say, you'll notice that there's a red, a yellow, and a green light. And every American knows that red or green means go, yellow means go faster, and red means you've got to stop. So uh, if you'll obey those, uh, or if you possibly can summarize in less time, it'd be appreciated since it'll leave more time for the many questions we'll have. Uh, before I introduce the witnesses, I would ask that all the witnesses please rise to take the oath required by the committee. Please raise your right hand. Do you all solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. It is now my pleasure to introduce our panel of witnesses. Ms. Milan Stark is the immediate past president of the International Trademark Association. Mr. Paul Meisner is vice president of, of global public policy at Amazon.com, who has already been mentioned more than, than most witnesses. Mr. John Horton is president of Legiscript. Mr. S Steve Met as Metallitz is counsel for the Coalition for Online Accountability. Mr. Bill Woodstock is executive director of Packet Clearing House. Mr. Steve uh, Debe, this is not my day, Del Bianco is executive director of NetChoice. Mr. Philip Corwin is counsel for the Internet Commerce Association. And last but not least, is Mr. Jonathan Zuck, president of ACT, the App Association. And with that, Madam, you get to go first. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Milan Stark, and I'm Senior Vice President of Intellectual Property for the Fox Entertainment Group. And I'm appearing today on behalf of the International Trademark Association, otherwise known as INTA, where I am serving on a voluntary basis as their immediate past president. It was my privilege to testify before this committee in 2011. At that time, I shared with you the trademark community's concerns regarding the launch of ICANN's new generic top-level domain, or GTLD, program. Today, I offer trademark owners' perspectives on ICANN's performance regarding the .sucks launch and the concerns it raises for the potential relinquishment of the National Telecommunications Information Administration, or NTIA's, stewardship of the IANA function. We greatly appreciate the committee's attention to these very important issues. The new GTLD program was designed to promote competition and innovation. It is a system based upon a participatory multi-stakeholder model, and as is true with any self-regulatory model, trust and accountability are essential. That means the system must have strong mechanisms in place to conduct its operations in a reliable and transparent way. Intellectual property owners of all sizes from all industries, both commercial and not-for-profit, must be able to trust that the new GTLD system will operate according to agreed-upon policies and procedures. This is necessary so that business owners can effectively protect their valuable trademarks in this new world, but more than that, Trust and predictability are required to satisfy the purported goal of the new system, fostering innovation. After all, no business will invest resources in an unreliable system. The launch of .sucks by Vox Populi is an example of ICANN's operational deficiencies. The new GTLD program followed extensive public comment on how the system would operate and what intellectual property rights mechanisms would be mandatory. In response to grave concerns vo uh, voiced by trademark owners during the public comment periods, ICANN did convene volunteer experts to address them. And that led to the implementation of new rights protection mechanisms to protect businesses and consumers from confusion, cyber squatting, fraud, and other abuse. One such mechanism is the Trademark Clearinghouse, 
which allows trademark owners to pre-register domains corresponding to their trademarks before such names are made available to the general public. It appears that Vox Populi is using this very mechanism designed to protect trademarks and consumers to charge businesses and nonprofits, both large and small, exorbitant fees to register their marks as domain names. Vox Populi co-ops the rights mechanisms developed by the multi-stakeholder community and uses it as a means to identify who pays 250 times more for a domain name. ICANN was warned about these bad practices and was asked to resolve the issues before the .sucks launch, but ICANN chose to ignore that request and the launch continues. The current .sucks controversy strongly suggests that the critical framework required for a successful transition of the IANA function does not yet exist. ICANN must enforce its own policies and contracts. The trademark community supports the multi-stakeholder model, and we are engaged in the processes that are shaping that framework. We support a transition, but not until we are assured of the necessary accountability and transparency. As ICANN's management of the .sex launch reveals, we simply are not there yet. Until such accountability mechanisms are implemented, continue U.S. government and congressional oversight is necessary. In conclusion, while there are many potential benefits from the new GTLD program, those benefits are unlikely to materialize unless the program is effectively and fairly administered. ICANN's decisions and actions directly impact not only the architecture and control of the Internet, but ultimately how consumers experience the Internet. As a trade association dedicated to brands and the consumer protection trademarks afford, INTA stands ready to help ICANN develop and implement a reliable framework that promotes fair competition, choice, and trust. We very much appreciate the committee's continued engagement in these matters, and thank you again for the opportunity to discuss the challenges facing trademark owners under ICANN's current policies and practices. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Meisner. Thank you, Chairman Issa and Mr. Nadler, uh, for your attention to this important topic, for holding this hearing, and for inviting me to testify. Amazon strongly supports the U.S. government's policy goals of maintaining Internet stability, security, and freedom from government control. But NTIA's planned transition of Internet governance functions to ICANN carries the significant risk that, despite NTIA's intentions, ICANN's multi-stakeholder process could be dominated, co-opted, or undermined by national governments ultimately jeopardizing these policy goals. Amazon's recent experience in ICANN provides a warning that seriously calls into question ICANN's ability and willingness to uphold the multi-stakeholder model. The international community simply has not yet demonstrated its commitment to ICANN's multi-stakeholder process free from government control. Ideally, this risk would be addressable through a transparent, rules-based, accountable multi-stakeholder process. So there is a very important for question for Congress to ask. Is the current ICANN multi-stakeholder process actually working free from government control? From Amazon's experience, it is not. To the contrary, Amazon's experience provides a warning about government control of ICANN. Our familiarity with the multi-stakeholder process at ICANN comes from our application for several GTLDs, including .Amazon. We believe the new GTLD program will provide a great opportunity for innovation and competition on the Internet, and we are thrilled to be a part of it. But our experience in the program raises serious concerns. In brief, the ICANN multi-stakeholder community worked for more than three years to develop rules for GTLD applicants, only to have ICANN ignore these rules under pressure from a handful of national governments, principally Brazil and Peru in the case of .Amazon and related applications. Our repeated good faith attempts to negotiate solutions with these governments, which have no legal rights to the term Amazon, were fruitless. Other national governments also quickly caved to the pressure, and eventually so did the United States. This willingness of ICANN, other governments, and even the U.S. to abandon the rules developed in a multi-stakeholder process because of pressure from a few national governments provides a warning that seriously calls into question the commitment of the international community to ICANN's multi-stakeholder process free from government control. The implications of this flawed treatment of Amazon stretch well beyond unfairness to a single company. This wasn't just a matter of ICANN and national governments, including the U.S. governments, failing to defend an American company, the treatment of which had no basis under national or international law. 
More importantly, these governments also failed to defend the ICANN multi-stakeholder process to which they supposedly were committed or to demand ICANN accountability. And if ICANN feels empowered to disregard its rules and procedures as well as snub the United States before the NTIA plan transition, one can only imagine what ICANN would feel emboldened to do after a transition were consummated. From a U.S. perspective, the point is not only that my company's legally protected interests were sacrificed to geopolitics, it's the way that they were sacrificed undermines the whole ICANN multi-stakeholder model and sets a precedent for ICANN and the United States to quickly cave to future pressure from foreign governments. Perhaps ICANN intended to demonstrate that it would not play favorites with American interests. If so, it went way too far, and instead of treating U.S. interests no differently than those of other countries, it consciously broke its own rules and harmed an American company. Bluntly stated, ICANN's current multi-stakeholder process is not free from government control. The mishandling of Amazon's GTLD applications is a blemish on ICANN's record, and because of how the rules developed in an ICANN multi-stakeholder process were quickly abandoned in the face of modest government pressure, this blemish is disqualifying, at least until cleared. Favorable resolution of Amazon's lawful applications is, nece is a necessary first step. But this incident is only part of a broader question of whether ICANN and the international community are fully committed to the multi-stakeholder model free from government control. If the commitment is only superficial, the United States should recognize it and address it now. And NTIA's planned transition should not occur unless and until independent review and other robust accountability reform mechanisms proposed by the multi-stakeholder community are established for ICANN. The internet stability, security, and freedom from government control are at stake. Thank you again for your attention to this topic, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Horton. Mr. Chairman, when my company, LegitScript, identifies an illegal, unsafe internet pharmacy, we notify the domain name registrar. When a registrar is notified that the domain name is being used for illegal activity, ICANN's accreditation scheme requires the registrar to do two things. First, to investigate the claims, and second, to respond appropriately. The good news is most registrars voluntarily disable domain names used to sell illegal, unsafe medicines that put patients' health and safety at risk. However, cyber criminals are rational economic actors and carefully choose a registrar that they believe will protect them. LegitScript's data indicates that just 12 among about 900 registrars maintain half of all illegal internet pharmacy registrations. In first place is Rebel, a registrar in the Momentus Group, which operates Socks which with only 0.05% of the total domain name market, but over 17% of the illegal online pharmacy market. Now, I'd like to talk about our experience notifying ICANN compliance about the few registrars that are a safe haven for criminal activity. Consider the website healthplugins.com selling morphine, Percocet, and other addictive drugs without a prescription. The domain name is registered with PACNIC in Pakistan, which refused to take action on this and hundreds of other illegal online pharmacies. ICANN closed our complaint against this registrar, finding that it responded appropriately despite leaving hundreds of illegal internet, illegal internet pharmacies online. Now, if you want to buy heroin online, you can do it at smackjunkshot.com. We notified the registrar, Webnik of Malaysia, which had told us in the past that it could not just suspend domain names because it would lose money. We submitted a complaint to ICANN, which closed the complaint, finding that the registrar responded appropriately by leaving a domain name used to sell heroin untouched, as well as hundreds of other illegal online pharmacies. Finally, let's consider an example from a momentous registrar, freeworldpharmacy.com, one of hundreds of illegal online pharmacy domain names that we have notified the company about. Mr. Chairman, these are the drugs that were sold to us without a valid prescription being required from freeworldpharmacy.com, and so that momentous could have no doubt about the domain names used for legal purposes, we sent a photo of these very drugs just a few weeks ago to, to Momentus. They took no action, and we have an ICANN complaint pending against Momentus right now. In the past, however, we have notified Momentus about illegal online pharmacies, including this one. They took little or no action, and ICANN has closed our complaints. I could go on and on, and in these folders, these two folders, I have screenshots of another 750 illegal online pharmacies that only continue operating because ICANN closed complaints against the registrar that took no action. We only stopped 750 in the interest of time. 
The point is, cyber criminals cluster at a small number of safe haven registrars who are running circles around ICANN compliance by persuading them that they are responding appropriately by doing nothing about domain names that they know full well are being used for illegal purposes, and those registrars are laughing all the way to the bank. In all of these cases, when we or law enforcement have asked ICANN what a registrar could possibly have done that constitutes an appropriate response in light of the ongoing use of domain names for illegal activity, ICANN compliance refuses to disclose it, keeping it a secret between ICANN and the registrar. The fundamental problem with this is a lack of transparency on the part of ICANN's compliance team. No reasonable person would believe that a registrar is responding appropriately to evidence that a domain name is being used to sell heroin by doing nothing. By finding that a registrar is responding appropriately in these cases, ICANN, in essence, gives a green light to the registrar to continue facilitating and profiting from the illegal activity, thereby putting internet users at risk. By refusing to explain what the registrar did that supposedly constitutes an appropriate response, ICANN lends the impression that it is participating in a cover-up. Accordingly, in the spirit of ICANN's long-standing commitment to transparency, I want to publicly challenge ICANN to disclose what steps these registrars took that purportedly constitute an appropriate response, despite being notified by LegitScript and in many cases by drug safety regulators and law enforcement that the domain names are being used to put everyday internet users' health and safety at risk. This lack of transparency and turning a blind eye to ongoing criminal activity, in my view, is emblematic and at the core of ICANN's problems with trust and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Metalitz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Nadler, members of the subcommittee, thanks very much for inviting me to offer once again the perspectives of the Coalition for Online Accountability. Our coalition represents U.S. associations, organizations, and companies that depend on the rules set by ICANN to enable us to enforce copyrights and trademarks online. First, I would like to salute the subcommittee for the crucial role it's played in providing oversight of ICANN issues over the past 15 years. Maintaining that long-established oversight record is critical to U.S. businesses that depend on copyright and trademark protection and to the millions of American workers that they employ. My colleagues at the table, and especially on my left, will have a lot to say about the IANA transition process and the accompanying effort to improve ICANN's accountability mechanisms. I think those accountability efforts are basically on the right track. But as a wise man once said, the past is prologue, and so is the present. So rather than speculate about ICANN's future, I'd like to focus on the way in which ICANN is now handling the critical domain name system functions over which the U.S. government ceded its contractual control years ago. As several members of the subcommittee have already noted, what ICANN is doing and not doing today is highly relevant to the terms and conditions of the IANA transition and to what accountability mechanisms are needed in the future. So very briefly, let's look at ICANN's current track record on three key issues, contract compliance, who is, and the new GTLD launch. We hear a lot about the ICANN multi-stakeholder model. What does that really mean? I think it boils down to this, replacing governmental regulation with private contracts and community oversight in managing the domain name system. For this model to work, the contracts must be strong and clear, and they must be vigorously and transparently enforced. Now, as John Horton has already mentioned, under the 2013 revision of the Registrar Accreditation Agreement, domain name registrars have new obligations to investigate and respond to complaints that the domain names they sponsor are being used for illegal activities, and that includes specifically copyright or trademark infringement. By now, most registrars have signed the 2013 agreement, but I have to report that registrars are not responding to these complaints, even when the facts are clear and the evidence of wrongdoing is overwhelming. Just as concerning, to date, ICANN is not yet taking action to clarify and enforce these RAA provisions, and as the previous witness said, <coughs> It's acting with a lack of transparency in its compliance efforts. Unless and until ICANN shows that it can effectively enforce the agreements that it has signed, its readiness for the completion of the transition will remain in question. And this track record must be taken into account in fashioning the enhanced accountability mechanisms that must accompany any further transition. 
The 2013 RAA also set in motion long overdue steps toward developing ground rules for the widespread phenomenon of proxy registration services. These have a legitimate role, but today the registrant contact data for more than one-fifth of all GTLD registrations, tens of millions, lurks in the shadows rather than in the sunlight of the publicly accessible WHOIS database. Further progress in bringing predictability and consistency to this proxy world is critical. If I can cannot do this, then the role of the WHOIS database in letting Internet users know who they're dealing with online, critical for accountability and transparency, will be seriously compromised. The next several months may show whether ICANN is up to the task. Finally, although ICANN is only about halfway through the current new GTLD launch, it's already starting to review the process. That review needs to be searching and comprehensive. We need to question and reevaluate the ship's heading, not just rearrange the deck chairs for the next voyage. The review has to address the fundamental issue of whether the rollout of an unlimited number of new top-level domains actually benefited the general public and brought greater choice to consumers, or whether it simply enriched intermediaries and speculators. In conclusion, thank you again for this subcommittee's continuing oversight of this fascinating experiment in non-governmental administration of critical Internet resources that we call ICANN. The, our coalition urges you to continue that role, especially with regard to contract compliance, who is, and the new GTLD review. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Woodcock. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, <clears throat> and members of the committee, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Bill Woodcock. I'm the Executive Director of Packet Clearinghouse, the <clears throat> international organization that builds and supports critical Internet infrastructure, including the core of the domain name system. I've served on the Board of Trustees of the American Registry for Internet Numbers for the past 14 years, and I've been continuously involved in the IANA process since the mid-1980s. Most relevant to the proceeding at hand, I'm one of the two North American representatives to the CRISP team, the process through which the Internet Numbers multi-stakeholder community has developed its IANA oversight transition proposal. I'm here today to explain why it's in the interest of both the U.S. government and other Internet stakeholders to ensure that the IANA oversight transition occurs on schedule and with undiminished strength of accountability. The IANA function comprises three discrete activities serving three different communities. The domain name community, which is represented by the other seven witnesses at the table here. The internet protocols community, which sets internet standards. And the internet numbers community, which manages the internet addresses that allow our devices to communicate. These three functions are completely independent of and separable from each other. Two of the three communities, protocols and numbers, produced the requested transition plans on schedule in January. The NAMES proposal, however, is still a work in progress. The protocols and numbers communities finished promptly because the IANA functions that serve them are very simple. The IANA function that serves NAMES is, as you've been hearing, substantially more complex. The NAMES community will not reach consensus in sufficient time to achieve a September 30 transition. But the numbers and protocols transitions are ready to be implemented now. Moving them forward as planned would show good faith on the part of the U.S. government and assure the world that the USG is a productive participant in the multi-stakeholder process rather than an obstacle. At the same time, allowing the names community the further time it needs would show that the U.S. government is neither throwing caution to the wind nor abandoning its responsibilities before ICANN accountability can be firmly established. If NTIA delays the protocols and numbers transitions, it will further the interests of those nations that are already displeased with the exceptional nature of the U.S. government's role in IANA oversight. A shift in the balance of Internet governance from the multi-stakeholder model of the U.S. government and the Internet community to the uh, intergovernmental model advocated by China and the ITU would be disastrous. But a timely transition of strong stakeholder oversight of the IANA function would achieve the goals of both the U.S. government and the global Internet community responsible administration of a critical resource with strong contractual accountability as stakeholders enforced within a jurisdiction that ensures that accountability is guaranteed by the rule of law. Under pressure from foreign governments to internationalize, ICANN has, over the past five years, gone from being a U.S. operation to one with offices and staff in Beijing, Geneva, Istanbul, Brussels, Montevideo, Seoul, and Singapore. This is clear evidence of other governments' influence on ICANN, influence that will only grow stronger over time. 
In my written testimony, I cite facts that demonstrate that the United States is the legal venue of choice of the international internet community whenever it is an available option. Across a sample of more than 142,000 internet contractual agreements that we analyzed, Strongly accountable contractual oversight of the IANA function allows the internet community to ensure that performance of the IANA function is never relocated to a jurisdiction with weaker rule of law or lesser protections against organizational capture. ICANN has performed the IANA function successfully because it's been disciplined by the mechanisms of U.S. government procurement, the right to remedy uncured defects with mechanisms up to and including contract termination, and the right to seek superior performance in the marketplace through periodic recompetition. We believe retaining these same strong accountability mechanisms after the transition is essential to ensure responsible performance of the IANA function. No good can come from delaying the transition of the protocols and numbers functions. At the same time, no good can come from hurrying the names community into an incompletely considered compromise. Their issues require carefully crafted solutions involving significant ICANN accountability reforms. But these policy level reforms are irrelevant to the simple mechanical tasks the IANA performs on behalf of the protocols and numbers communities. In conclusion, only the U.S. government can ensure that commitment to a successful IANA transition is realized and act as the guarantor of the success of the multi-stakeholder governance model. The interests of the U.S. government and of the global Internet stakeholder community are both served by a transition of the IANA protocols and numbers functions on time on September 30 of this year, as long as the communities are contractually empowered to enforce the accountability of the IANA function operator in the same manner that the U.S. government has successfully done for the past 16 years. I ask you to use Congress' unique power of oversight over NTIA to ensure that our commitments are met and the transition of protocol and numbers functions occur as scheduled. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Deli. I'm doing great. It's a, and it's a famous name, too. Uh, De Del Bianco. Thank you. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Nadler, members of the committee. Uh, you've heard a lot today about operational problems at ICANN, but would really, what would really dot suck is an unaccountable ICANN after the transition, when we've lost the leverage for hearings like this to have much effect on the organization. Over 17 years, our government has protected ICANN's multi-stakeholder model from government encroachment and helped ICANN to mature. And that's saying something, because the goal for a computer scientist is to build something that can last as least as long as it takes to finish building it. And ICANN is still a work in process. But it is not sustainable for the U.S. to retain its unique role forever, particularly in the post-Snowden political climate. So NTIA asked the community for proposals to replace its stewardship role for IANA. And Chairman Goodlatte asked in a blog post earlier this year, quote, what guarantees and capabilities and conditions should first be demanded and stress tested by the global community? Well, the global community has answered with hundreds of meetings in the last several months, tens of thousands of man hours, um, many of them overnight since we cycle through global time zones. And our community proposals are on a very good start. They give the community new powers to challenge board actions via independent review panels and issue binding decisions, to veto bylaws changes proposed by the ICANN board so they can't undo what we've done, to veto strategic plans and budgets proposed by the board, and to remove individual board directors or spill the entire board if we need to. Stress testing has helped us to assess whether these new powers would let the community challenge an ICANN decision or inaction and to hold the board accountable, as an aside, we saw a little need to stress test the technical operations of the core internet functions that Bill talked about, because they're provided by very uh, experienced operators who are actually stress tested every day. However, stress tests did help us see that ICANN's bylaws have to change in other ways. The first stress test in my April 24 testimony to your committee was ICANN quitting its affirmation of commitments. So the community has said, let's move some of the commitments and reviews from the affirmation into ICANN's bylaws. Another stress test was the governments changing the way they make their decisions at ICANN by moving to majority voting. That would expand government power over ICANN decisions, so we, the community, have proposed changing ICANN bylaws to seek a mutually acceptable solution with the governments, but only where their decision was reached through true consensus. Added transparency and powers would also help us to avoid situations like dot sucks, which I tend to look at as more like a, a, a set of stress tests of decisions made by ICANN to pass evaluation on an applicant who owed substantial fees, 
or the decision to negotiate a special million dollar fee with a single applicant. So turning back to the community proposals for transition, we need details, I understand that, and we need review by global stakeholders, so this will not be ready by September of 2015. Uh, the timeline on the display board in front of you and on some of the paper that I distributed shows that we just can't get there from where we are. But even with an extension in time, we worry that ICANN's board and management will resist the approval of these plans and impede its implementation. The role of Congress then in this historic transition could be critical. What Congress can do while we still have the leverage is to insist that NTIA require ICANN to accept and implement the final community proposals as a condition of the IANA transition they seek. This is, after all, our last chance to use the leverage we're about to relinquish. So let's leave a lasting legacy where the internet community gets the same kind of accountability from ICANN that shareholders demand today from their corporations, that my members demand from my trade association, and frankly, that voters and citizens demand from you. We don't, I don't think the global community deserves anything less than that which we use for the other institutions we count upon to make our lives work better. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Crown. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Nadler, Subcommittee Members, I'm Philip Corwin on behalf of the Internet Commerce Association, a domain industry trade group and member of ICANN's business constituency, which I represent on ICANN's GNSO Council. I commend the subcommittee for this hearing. Congress has a legitimate interest in an IANA transition and enhanced ICANN accountability that proceeds soundly and effectively. The stakes include the security and stability of the DNS, internet free expression and uncensored information. Two cliches are apropos today. The first is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The IACA consensus that U.S. stewardship has been benign and beneficial and that ICANN accountability should proceed on its own merits. But the second is, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. The NTIA's announcement raised global expectations. Hundreds of ICANN community members have already expended thousands of hours in designing transition and accountability measures. Therefore, Congress should not reflexively oppose the IANA transition, but should exercise strong oversight in support of ICANN stakeholders. While enhanced ICANN accountability measures are overdue, they will operate best only if ICANN's board and senior staff embrace a culture of accountability that assumes responsibility for the fallout of ICANN decisions and encompasses early consultation with the multi-stakeholder community that provides its organizational legitimacy. We're some distance from that culture. The road to the NTI's announcement led through Montevideo and Brasilia and was paved by ICANN's misappropriation of the Snowden disclosures. The CEO's travels in South America were backed by a secret September 2013 ICANN board resolution. These actions were not transparent or accountable and reflected no community consultation. ICANN's community is now on the right stewardship and accountability track, but a final package will not be ready by September 30th, much less the implementation of required pre-transition accountability measures. Therefore, NTIA should announce an ICANN contract extension soon. The final package must set key community rights in tandem with ICANN accountabilities in its bylaws and articles of incorporation. Turning to .sucks, ICANN's request that the FTC and OCA in Canada determine its legality was an abdication of responsibility rather than its embrace. ICANN had more than a year to explore and take appropriate action under multiple contract options. There are other new TLD program issues. While the jury's still out on the program's ultimate success, the total number of new domains seems larger than market demand, and many TLDs are practically giving domains away, which aid spammers and fishers. Major unresolved consumer protection and technical issues remain unsolved, as well as uncertainty about spending $60 million in auction fees that ICANN has collected. The rights protection mechanisms for new TLDs are working well, but any review of domain dispute procedures should set standard contracts between ICANN and arbitration providers that ensure uniform administration. There are some, no such contracts today. 
ICANN must start taking responsibility for fair administration of domain disputes. Finally, ensure, besides ensuring full satisfaction of NTIA's principles, Congress should confirm that ICANN's continued post-transition U.S. jurisdiction is accepted and not a new irritation for those who would make ICANN a multilateral organization. You should also know that the transition does not mean ICANN will assume technical operation of key internet functions. ICANN lacks the technical capacity to do so and is dependent on the experience and expertise of stakeholders for maintaining core functions. While the NTI's announcement requires stakeholders to address certain important policies, there is no equivalent need to revamp DNS technical operations. The continued operational excellence of those operations will bolster the confidence of global users in the Internet's stability, security, and resilience. I hope my testimony has been helpful to your inquiry. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I yield back the remaining 30 seconds of my time. Thank you, Mr. Corwin. Mr. Zucks. Zuck. Thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the subcommittee. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, back clean up here today, and I guess we'll see as the television series in the late 70s said, eight is in fact enough. Um, ACT, the App Association, represents over 5,000 app developers and information technology firms with businesses in every congressional district uh, and part of a really booming industry. When we talk about the domain name system as we are today, it's important to remember that these small businesses, like the ones I represent, are actually the majority of the domain name holders. Small businesses around the world have used the World Wide Web to create presence for themselves and distribution for their products that simply wasn't available in the physical world on par with their larger brethren. The stability and integrity of the DNS is more important to small businesses than to any other community. The basic question we have in front of us today is whether or not ICANN is ready to uh, be independent of the United States government. The simple answer that one can glean from the testimony you've already heard is no but with the caveat that it can be with the enhanced accountability sought by the multi-stakeholder community in the proposed uh, uh, measures uh, that were released on May 4th. If you'll allow me to paraphrase Winston Churchill, ICANN is the worst model for internet governance except for all the others. My personal journey here has been somewhat circuitous. I'm a former software developer that went on to represent software developers. And for a number of years, small businesses I represent were indifferent to the inner workings of ICANN because the DNS seemed to be working, until some articles came out in 2005 suggesting that governments wanted the function of ICANN to be intergovernmental instead of multi-stakeholders, uh, it has been. Suddenly, all these small businesses were wearing ICANN Rocks t-shirts oh. and asking me to get involved uh, it directly in the ICANN process. And so, over the past 10 years, in some 30 meetings and windowless conference rooms around the world, we've worked together with the community and the NTIA to make ICANN a stronger, better managed, and more accountable organization. I'm pleased to say we've achieved some success in a number of areas, um, and my constant refrain on performance metrics has led to me to have the nickname Metrics Man uh, inside of the community, and it's a, a nickname I wear with pride. Of course, as you've already heard today, there's still a lot to be done to create the ICANN the multi-stakeholder community deserves. As a member of the intellectual property constituency within ICANN, I stand with my colleagues in frustration with ICANN's handling of the new GTLD program and the needs of rights holders in particular. That sucks is just one example and a frightening precedent for lies ahead for those trying to protect their intellectual property. ICANN needs to find better mechanisms to protect IP while increasing consumer choice and competition in the domain name space and they have to get serious about enforcing their contracts. If digital archery is anything to go by, ICANN should certainly leave the tech to the experts and keep themselves in a management role. Finally, ICANN needs to find better ways to involve small businesses and to resolve their issues when they arise. The system is currently overwhelming and over costly for companies that I represent to be meaningfully involved in the multi-stakeholder process. It's for these reasons that I view the pending IANA functions contract expiration as an opportunity on which to capitalize rather than something frightening to be avoided. What has been missing for all the reform efforts inside ICANN has been the teeth to make these reforms binding. It is certainly the case that NTIA have provided an essential guidance and protection of ICANN throughout the years, but the true utility of this unique relationship reached its pinnacle with the affirmation of commitments in 2009. The announcement by NTIA of their plans to sunset the IANA functions contract has spurred a discussion of real ICANN accountability, the likes of which the organization has never seen. 
As others have mentioned, thousands of people hours in the community have set forth a proposed accountability framework that promises binding accountability to the multi-stakeholder community. This new ICANN, ICANN 3.0, if you will, will be stronger, answer to the community it serves, and create an environment of constructive reform that will allow it to develop and grow as the internet adds its next billion users. That said, it's true that we have just one chance to get it right, and I believe that's where Congress can play a critical role. As Chairman Goodlatte wrote in his recent op any less in the hands of the U.S. government. So once again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I hope you'll join me in making the most of this historic opportunity. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, and thank you for paraphrasing Churchill. He, he never actually delineated whether the British parliamentary system or the U.S. republic system was, and federalism was better, so perhaps we can work that out in ICANN. Uh, the English and Scots are finding out, says the ranking member. Uh, with that, I ask unanimous consent that a rather lengthy letter to John O'Jeffrey from David Hosp be placed in the record. This letter uh, from the offices of Fish and Richardson it was referred to by the ranking member and I'm sure will come up uh, in our discussions. Without objection, so ordered. I'll now recognize myself. Uh, and I'll start with a simple question for all eight panelists. The question simple, hopefully the answer will be yes or no. Do we need more time? Do we need to exercise the extension in order to get it right in the transition? Let's start. So what I would say is um, it's not about focusing on a specific date. Chairman, it's what you say. We have to get it right. The stakes are very very high. So rather than trying to put an artificial timeline to this, I think what's important is to focus on the work that's being done and the progress that's being made. So brief, I'll come back to you on this, I promise, but briefly, do we need more time than the short time remaining on the existing transition? Um, certainly for public comment. INTA has actually formally requested an extension of time on the comment periods for the accountability. Right. Um, each, each of you, do we need more time? Yes. Yes, although that's not the fundamental problem. Yes, we do. For protocols and numbers, absolutely not. We've already been waiting for four months. For names, absolutely yes, they need the time to get it right. Yes, we need more time, as the chart indicates, and a piecemeal approach, as Mr. Woodcock has discussed, leaves a very small piece of the meal for the naming community. Mr. Corwin. Oops. Uh, Chairman, yes, absolutely we need uh, more time, and in particular, I'd, I'd single out that the proposal put out by the working group on the naming functions, uh, they need to schedule a second comment period. They put out an incomplete proposal for only 28 days comment, and uh, they can't send it on to the next step until they give us a full proposal. Is that clean up? I definitely what would Churchill say? <laughs> Churchill would say that, of course, we need more time, but not indefinitely. I mean, I think something along the lines of six months would be enough to really get the proposal locked down and get public comment and feedback, So, get something implemented. Paraphrasing for all of you, you do support a multi-stakeholder transition as long as the, all the prerequisites are met. It's a bottom-up approach, and the transition is one that we can live with for the long run. Good. Stark, I want to go back to you. Uh, in light of if you will, dot sucks, dot Amazon, perhaps the drug uh, explanations that were so articulately said, do we need and how do we get, you know, sort of point by point, do, how do we get to the kind of consistency and enforcement that is necessary to protect trademark holders, copyright holders, and obviously uh, the lawful acts on the internet that are you know, unlawful acts that are prohibited? So I think that the answer, thank you very much for that question, because I think it gets really to the heart of the matter. I think the real answer is that ICANN needs to actually enforce its existing contracts and policies. In a lot of these regards, we're not asking for something new or more. We had a multi-stakeholder process from the bottom up that developed the rights protection mechanisms, that developed the who is policies and other things that exist in the contracts, but we're not seeing proper resources devoted to compliance and enforcement. 
Do you think there need to be management changes or structural changes in the management to get that done? In other words, they used to do something, they're doing it less well rather than better. Do you see that as a management failure? You know, I, I don't feel that I'm qualified to speak about their management. You don't need to name names, just... <laughs> <laughs> but what I do think is that it's very important for this model to work that all relevant interests are represented and listened to and that that input is actually analyzed in a meaningful way and then incorporated into the policies and procedures. Okay, now I'm going to ask one more question. It'll probably get several comments. Uh, whether it's uh, dot sucks or if you were going to have a German version of it, apparently it'd be dot, dot sucked, S-A-U-G-T, I have no idea what it would be in Italian, in Chinese, in all the other possible languages. What I do know is that there's 1,025,000 recognized names in the English language. And if we assume for a moment that we're going to promote and allow a proliferation of dot somethings uh, simply to gain more money, do you believe that inherently the stakeholders and I'll leave those who sell names out of the stakeholder business. The stakeholders, the actual users, the people who want perhaps one name for each function, perhaps only one name, period, are well served by trying to use every possible name in 209 plus languages. Now, if, you, if I see no answer, I'll assume that you all think it is really a bad idea to simply proliferate, na proliferate names that end up with people having to buy thousands of them. Quickly. Thank you, Chairman Issa. The notion of more names comes about because we found ourselves 10 or 11 years ago with 20 generic top-level domains and none of them in a script other than the Latin script. In other words, nothing in Chinese or Korean or Japanese, Arabic. We, we found ourselves, we hadn't built the internet out. So what the community did is allowed people to propose names. That's why we end up with thousands of names proposed. There were no rules or structure about knowing that we would have one in the complaint category and one in the car category. If the community were to move in that direction for the next round, we'd need several years probably of policy to come up with the structure of how many would we have in each category. There's plenty of conversations along the lines of what you've suggested, the idea of categories as opposed to wide open season like we've had in this round, but it would take the community to develop that. Okay, quickly, because my time has expired. Yeah, yes, I, I would agree. That you, what you've described is how I can approach this most recent round. And I, while the jury is still out because they're only halfway through the round, I think it's going to find that the public has not been served by letting anybody who wants to uh, get any domain name, uh, top-level domain that they wish, uh, without any criteria and without ICANN really making any, any decisions, uh, letting them do that. Yes, sir. There are technical security reasons for allowing uh, uh, brand TLDs, allowing corporations to register their own top-level domain in order to be able to secure it more effectively. I'll, I'll close with just one statement. That letter from, to Fish and Richardson, from Fish and Richardson says to me, don't, please don't say that this is legalized extortion. Please don't say that when we have an auctioning process that not only makes more money in debt relief to ICANN, but in fact charges exorbitant prices to the very people who already own the intellectual property that is effectively being ransomed. Please don't call it legalized extortion. Well, I take great pride that under speech and debate, right or wrong, I call it legalized extortion. I now recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Metallitz, I hope I got that right. Mr. Metallitz, a recent net name study found that 24% of global internet traffic is dedicated to the infringing transfer of copyrighted content. Other data indicate that 68% of the top 500 pirate sites reside on U.S. registries. 59% reside on .com, .net, and .org, giving them an air of legitimacy. What contractual requirements and obligations uh, should registries, registrars, and registrants have uh, to deal with this that we don't have? Uh, thank you for that question, Mr. Nadler. Uh, the, the problem, you've, you've, you've uh, uh, correctly stated that we have a huge problem in the legacy top-level domains, com and net and org, and that the contractual uh, restrictions within in their uh, uh, 
contract with ICANN are not sufficient. And one of the things that uh, has been pointed out is there may be ways that we can use some of the advances that were made in the GTLD space. The new GTLDs had to take on some additional commitments to respond to copyright piracy and trademark counterfeiting in their spaces. Uh, we should look at applying those to, uh, uh, to, to the legacy GTLDs as well. That's part of the ICANN answer. Obviously, there may be things that can be done on a, on a legislative level because these registries are based in the United States. So look back. Pardon? Look back and apply some of the, some of what's being applied to the new uh, domain names to the, yes. the old ones. Yes, and, and, and it's a step forward that this registrar accreditation agreement does apply to registrations in .com and .net, so, so uh, pirate sites or sites engaged in illegal pharmacies can be addressed that okay. way if, if those agreements are enforced. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Uh, Ms. Ms. Stark. Um, <coughs> What are your views on the legality of the fee structure for early registration of certain premium dot sucks domains at nearly $2,500? I understand there's a set of right. I understand there are a set of rights protection mechanisms that operators of new GTLDs must follow, which are intended to achieve the laudable goal of combating cyber squatting. As the chief trademark counsel of a major U.S. corporation, do you believe the structure being forwarded by Vox Populi with the with the assent of ICANN? violates at least the spirit of the, registry, of the registry agreement, and what can be done about it? I absolutely do believe that it violates the spirit of the agreement. I mean, the whole purpose of these rights protection mechanisms, like the clearinghouse, were to make an efficient system for intellectual property owners to protect their rights, and ultimately to help protect consumers from confusion and other types of abuse online. So when you take that mechanism and use it and turn it on its head, to create some sort of premium pricing structure so that people who are being responsible and taking advantage of the mechanisms that the community developed to help them um, navigate this new world, and you turn that on its head and turn it into a premium pricing structure, I absolutely think that violates the spirit. So that should be banned? I, I do think that you don't... That pricing structure, that is, should be banned. Yeah, I don't think that you want to necessarily set premium... I'm not saying there can't be premium pricing or that you can't have all kinds of pricing arrangements. I just don't think that you want to do it in a way that takes something that's meant to protect trademark owners well, it would to be harm e them. Well, it would be easy. I don't know that it would be right, but it would be easy to say no premium pricing arrangements. If you didn't say that, how would you distinguish decent ones from ones that, that, that shouldn't be allowed. So I think that that's a process that has to come up through the community and the multi-stakeholder process. There are many different relative, um, relevant stakeholders in that, and if there are going to be limits on what happens in the pricing, that should okay. come from the community. So Congress shouldn't do anything about this. We should leave it to the multi-stakeholder process. I think if we really are going to believe in the model, that there should be oversight, but that the model should be allowed to work. Okay, thank you. Mr. Zuck. <coughs> The concerns over new GTLDs and potential IP and trademark infringements are well known, but there are extensive infringements in the dot-com space. I understand there are over 65,000 dot-coms that incorporate the word sucks, for example. Shouldn't these be equally concerning? And what can you tell the committee about plans for adding additional rights protections to legacy GTLDs like dot-com? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it, it is, in fact, the case that a lot of these issues have come up in the old TLDs, as, as you mentioned, and SUC shows up uh, plenty of different places, and so there is a constant and ongoing debate about whether there's a difference between the second level and the top level domain in terms of the t terms used. And I think a strong argument can be made that there's closer monitoring needed for the top level domains, the stuff to the right of the period than is necessarily necessary inside of the, uh, uh, an individual domain. I think as Mr. Metallet said, I think taking some of the new contract arrangements that have been developed for the new GTLDs and applying to the old ones can go a long way. But the reality is that a lot of the um, principles of protection are already in place, and it's just an execution issue of getting those contracts better enforced. Is, is the best thing that we can do, and to make sure the WHOIS database is accurate so that uh, 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 IP owners can go after infringers are, are the key issues. Thank you, Mr. Corwin. In your, my last question, because I see my light, the, the warning lights on. In your testimony, you say there are too many new GTLDs. 
Will the market take care of an oversupply, or should ICANN have limited the number of applications from the outset? Well, or should they now limit the I'm outset? not sure I said there's too many. I said that the jury's still out on the overall success of the program. Uh, so far, and I represent professional domain investors, and, and they're being very selective about which new TLDs they're acquiring uh, new domains in. Uh, the way I've thought about it is what company would introduce 1,400 new products in an 18-month period? I don't know any company that would do that. The market gets confused when there's that much new choice and new product. Even the people within the community have a hard time keeping up with all the name names introduced each week. And as a result, we see some of the leading uh, domain, top-level domains in terms of total registrations offering domains free or for 49 cents to a dollar to hype up their numbers, but it's not clear that anyone's going to renew those domains when they uh, put the prices up at market uh, price. So the jury's out, but I, I, th I just don't see personally uh, market demand for 1,400 new ones, of which 800 are for the general public. C could I just speak briefly to your last question? A dot suck second level domain uh, under the World Intellectual Property Organization arbitration uh, uh, guidance if it's uh, particularly in North America and the U.S. where we have the First Amendment, if you have company name dot sucks, company name sucks dot com, uh, if it's a website used for legitimate criticism of a company or an individual, uh, it is not infringement. If it is using that name to and, and then infringing on their trademarks or their copyright and intellectual property, it is infringement. So you have to look at the content of the website, but the big difference is that nobody with a dot-com suck site is asking $2,500 a year to register to, why is to, that? to the target. If I may, why is nobody doing that on the legacy uh, TLDs? Excuse me? Why is nobody doing that on the do, on, on dot-com? Uh, well, well, you're saying that they're doing it on the new ones and not doing it on the old ones. Why? Dot-com dot site uh, pricing is uh, uh, frozen right now under a Commerce Department decision and the in other incumbent uh, top-level domains tended to price around the same amount as dot-com around eight dollars per domain per year simply to be competitive. They, uh, they couldn't get too high above that price and uh, attract customers. My time has expired. Well, but, Thank you. Gentlemen, briefly yield for a follow-up. I'll yield my non-existent time gladly. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to follow up and understand this. I've looked and, and Jerry Nadler sucks.com and org are both available. Daryl Issa sucks.com and org for anyone that wants them are available and I'm sure someone will find them. But they are in fact at GoDaddy 999 and 799 respectively. We're not what, in great demand. We're not in great demand. <laughs> but my understanding is that Amazon sucks.com has been bought up by Amazon. The fact is that there's already been a long legacy of buying names to try to protect them. This latest shakedown is because there's now a new name and a new opportunity, and it's not available to first come, first serve. In other words, GoDaddy and the other uh, sellers are not out there competing, something that we believe in, to try to sell you a name that mul multiple people can sell. You have an exclusive holder of a name who is holding it ransom uh, as a form of extortion. Isn't that correct? Well, uh, it's it certainly, there's a big difference between uh, Daryl Isasucks.com, excuse me for saying that, it's not my personal belief, uh, being available. I, the hearing is young. If it's registered, if it's criticizing your views on politics, it's okay. If it's But I'm only you, dealing in the price. But, but, but you can still acquire it for nine ninety nine a year, not 2500 a year. Uh, to, to add to what Ms. Stark said, uh, there was an ICANN staff report on the new rights protection mechanism group, and this was the numbers as of February. At that time, there were 4 million total registrations and new TLDs, but there were 25 million claims notices generated. Now, explain that when someone starts to register a term that's registered in the trademark claim house, let's say it's Amazon, uh, they get a notice that your use of this domain may be infringing, uh, and then it's their decision if they want a website about the Amazon rainforest, they can go ahead. If they want to pretend they're Amazon, they do it at their own risk. There were not, in my opinion, there were not six times as many attempts to register infringing domains as there were actual domains registered at that point in time. And I 
I've written an article about this. I talked to the trademark clearinghouse people at the Inter meeting last week in San Diego. The only explanation I can get is that some parties, and they may be operators in new registries, began registrations not with the intent of registering domains, but to find out every time they get a claims notice back, they say, oh, that name's in the clearinghouse, and now I can set a premium price for it. So a mechanism that was put in place to protect trademark holders is now being used to set extremely high prices for trademark owners. I thank the gentleman. Our, t our time has expired. Mr. Forbes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, one aspect of the proposed transfer that we've not talked about in this committee but has received attention on the House Armed Services Committee in which I serve is what happens to the .mil and .gov top-level domains. Even though .mil and .gov are used by the U.S. military, first responders, and federal and state government agencies, the U.S. government may not actually own those domains. So I'd like to ask Mr. Corn and Mr. Del Bianco whether you agree that a reasonable condition of the IANA transition should include a written agreement that the U.S. government has an exclusive, perpetual, no-cost right to those domains. Thank you, Representative Forbes. It's quite easy, I think, for ICANN to give DOD and GSA permanent contracts, permanent irrevocable contracts for mill and gov. What's harder, though, is to ensure that we have legal reach to force ICANN to honor those contracts. Let me explain. This is about the risks of having .gov or .mil be redirected during an emergency, made it like a coordinated attack on U.S. systems and infrastructure. For over 100 countries, their .gov domain is at the second level. It's to the left of the dot of gov.ca for Canada or .uk for the U.K. Um, I'm not 50 countries have .mil to the left of the dot for their country code. What's the difference? Well, their gov and mil is housed in a server on their soil under their law and under their total control. For the U.S., it's a little different. As the inventor of the Internet, our .mil and .gov are at the top level, or the root of the DNS, and that is what the IANA contract is all about. So we ought to ensure that ICANN remains subject to U.S. law and that the root remains physically on U.S. soil to address the concerns that you brought up. And we have a stress test on that, you'll be glad to know. And we found that Article 18 of ICANN's bylaws requires the principal office of ICANN to stay in California, and if ICANN board attempted to change the bylaw, one of those new powers I described earlier could block that change. But if this community and this committee feel strongly, we could move Article 18 to the fundamental bylaws of the, the transition. That would mean that the community would have to give 75% approval of the board's attempt to leave the United States jurisdiction. Good. Mr. Corwin? Just to add to that, uh, these, of course, this is the legacy of the fact that the United States invented the Internet and created these two top-level domains for military and government use. Uh, the transition should, of course, ensure that there's permanent contracts uh, for the U.S. to continue operating them in perpetuity. Uh, this is also why it's important that ICANN jurisdiction stay within the U.S. It's also important to maintain U.S. jurisdiction because I want to commend ICANN. ICANN has funded two very expert outside law firms to work at the direction of the community to design the new accountability measures, but they're being designed to fit within the framework of California Public Benefit Corporation law, and if the jurisdiction ever changes, the accountability measures may no longer work or work as effectively. So uh, keeping these requires a contract, and making sure that stays stable over the decades requires maintaining U.S. jurisdiction. Good. Thank you. Um, Ms. Stark, Ms. Meis Mr. Meisner, I'm not sure if I'll be able to get this question in my time, but if you were to visit ICAM's website and read the description for the Government Advisory Committee, it states the GAC is not a decision-making body. However, there are growing concerns regarding the GAC's influence over ICAM's multi-stakeholder process. As representatives who are involved in the multi-stakeholder process at ICAM, can you shed some light on any notable examples where the GAC has interfered in the multi-stakeholder process which directly impacted your company or re your respective companies, and what can be done to curb the growing influence of the GAC over the ICANN Board of Directors, and what type of unintended consequences do you think the IANA transition will have on the GAC? Either one of you, you have to. I've only got about 60 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Forbes, very much. Yeah, much. We have a, uh, a very clear example of where the Government Advisory Committee uh, stepped in and uh, caused the Board to reverse what had been uh, a fairly uh, uh, 
straightforward process in which we were, had applied for uh, .amazon and some affiliated uh, uh, top little domain uh, names. Look, we, we support the proposed accountability reforms for ICANN, and I think they're, they're a great idea. Uh, but I think, very importantly, they can't just be applied prospectively. Uh, ICANN always should have been accountable, and they shouldn't just now start to be accountable when they're forced to be so. Good. Stark, anything you'd like to add? I would just say that we do think that the Government Advisory Council plays a very important role in the process and should be advisory, but um, as the Amazon example shows, it, it's dangerous when any one or few governments um, are able to block what has been the process that was created by the full multi-stakeholder community. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, I now ask unanimous consent that the letter that prompted the earlier letter from IPC be placed in the record without objection so ordered. We also were in receipt of a letter from ICANN uh, that I'd like placed in the record without objection so ordered. We now go to the gentleman from Michigan for his thoughtful questions and comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, follow up on a uh, Nadler type question, which uh, I would start off with Mr. Metallus. Uh, you, we've discussed something about the obligations uh, on registrars and ICON. Now, <clears throat> in your view, are the registers meeting these obligations and is ICON enforcing them sufficiently? Uh, thank you, Mr. Conyers. Uh, well, with, with respect to the uh, uh, particular obligations I talked about in my testimony, the obligation to investigate and respond when they receive a report that a domain name that they've sold is being used to carry out illegal activity. No, I do not think that the registrars are uh, complying with that, and I do not think that ICANN is yet requiring them to do so. This is something we're continuing to engage both with ICANN and with registrars about, but as if, if you take a snapshot today, these provisions are not being enforced. Uh, Mr. Uh, Horton, uh, do you concur with that uh, view? Turn on your mic. My apologies, um, <clears throat> Mr. Conyers. I concur with part of it. Our experience has been a little bit different. Um, as I testified, we've actually seen that most domain name registrars voluntarily uh, terminate services to illegal online pharmacies, and that may be because of the, the health and safety risks involved in that particular area. It is a, a relatively small number of domain name registrars that are responsible uh, for most of the problem. Uh, but again, I'm only talking about one particular area of abuse. We don't keep data on these other uh, types of areas. Uh, I do concur, however, uh, that uh, when a uh, complaint is submitted to ICANN compliance, that they are not uh, requiring um, compliance with Section 3.18. Uh, the core problem is uh, this phrase, to respond appropriately. Uh, what does that mean? They have latitude to interpret that, and they have uh, not done so in an effective way. Uh, Ms. Stark, uh, how do you weigh in on this question? So I really do think that, um, I agree with Mr. Horton, that there are some uh, that are very good about responding, but I do think that ICANN has not devoted enough resources in general to compliance and that there are important parts of the contract that need um, greater attention from ICANN directly. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Zuck, uh, uh, you're on ICON's uh, IP Working Group. Uh, how, how does your experience uh, stack up to the other uh, contributions that have been made thus far? Um, thank you for the question, Congressman. I, I guess our experience has been similar. I've been uh, kind of assigned within the intellectual property constituency to be sort of the uh, uh, hound dog to uh, the compliance department inside ICANN, and uh, I was uh, horrified to discover a few years ago that their database of complaints and responses was a folder in Outlook. Um, 
uh, some 10 years into the organization's uh, uh, growth. And so uh, I think that they've come a long way from the standpoint of even keeping track of what they're doing um, over the past five years. And uh, they still need to do a lot better job. And I think that the new GTLD program came at a time that made it easy to overwhelm them. Um, but I think they've made some progress, but there's certainly a long way to go in terms of contract compliance uh, with an ICANN. But I, I, uh, it's uh, not quite the horror that it was five years ago. What uh, other uh, suggestions or experience would you like to uh, make on, on this subject? Thank you, Mr. Conyers. Steve Del Bianco here. Two other improvements we're making as part of our proposal. One would to make sure that when the community feels like compliance isn't happening, the community would have standing for the first time to be able to file for an independent review panel. And the community wouldn't have to come up with the million dollars it takes to pay for the attorneys and panelists. Gosh. So we're building in the ability to challenge those decisions. And when the panel comes back with a decision, it'll be binding on ICANN. The second would be that every year when ICANN puts forth a budget, if that budget lacks adequate funding, for the systems that they need in compliance, like Mr. Zook talked about. If it lacks the funding for compliance officers, we as a community can veto the budget until ICANN board comes back with the right budget. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Just a footnote to that. I think, let's not kid ourselves about this. There are many issues here where the, the community, the entire community, might not see eye to eye. That community includes the registrars and registries that in fact provide over 90 percent of the funding for ICANN. And this is the problem that ICANN's facing in trying to develop a culture of compliance. It's very difficult to do that when you have to negotiate with and enforce rules against the people that are writing the checks that pay your salary. So uh, this is a, a, a problem that's inherent in the model, and I think it's something where maybe we, the community as a whole may not see the need, but certainly if you look at American businesses that depend on copyright and trademark protection, we certainly see the need, and we need some mechanism to make sure that ICANN responds accordingly. I see that Mr. Horton concurs with that view. Uh, Mr. Conyers, I do, and I think that the additional uh, thing that I would urge is transparency. Um, as I, I testified, I think the core problem is that uh, ICANN compliance is uh, making decisions about what, what constitutes um, an appropriate response and then does not explain why. If they're making the right decision, what do they have to be afraid about in disclosing it to the multi-stakeholder community? Thank you all very much. Chairman, I yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Farenthold. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Medlitz, I understand the importance of protecting intellectual property. Uh, and what you're asking ICANN to do here, though, kind of sounds a lot like what uh, y'all tried and failed to get Congress to do with SOPA and PIPA. Uh, isn't there, in effect, a forcing down of takedown of websites outside of the reach of U.S. law on a basis of an allegation of infringement without any type of hearing or due process? I mean, it, it, that, that's kind of troubling to me. Would you like to comment? Yes I, yes, I would. I think this is really an issue of whether ICANN will enforce the contracts that it's, it's entered into. These contracts were negotiated. They were subject to public comment. There was a lot of public input. Um, and, and throughout the community, there was agreement that these would be the, the contractual standards. Those included uh, uh, concern about how domain names were used. Not, anytime you're talking about how a domain name is used, it's often being used to point to content, whether it's sales of illegal drugs, whether it's uh, 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 streaming and downloading of, of pirate material. So this is all firmly The, the concern IP. remains yeah. similar to SOPA and PIPA, that you'll cast such a broad net, you'll infringe on, uh, on, on people's free speech rights. I think that's a concern, but I think if we can have this dialogue with ICANN about the way in which they will interpret, apply, and, and enforce this requirement to investigate and to respond appropriately, we can have that discussion about what the safeguards would be. But we need first to get ICANN to commit to enforcing and transparently doing so uh, these uh, contracts they've entered into. Right. All right, and uh, Mr. Meisner, given ICANN's accountability problems and the tendency to bend to the will of uh, government, how can we in Congress ensure that uh, ICANN's problems won't become worse and threaten the stability of the uh, internet after uh, uh, the U.S. government terminates its contract with ICANN. 
Thanks, Mr. Farentol, very much. Uh, I think what Congress needs to do is ensure that ins NTIA insists on these accountability reforms that they be made in uh, ICANN's bylaws as a uh, condition precedent to the actual transition of the IANA functions. Uh, also, of course, it would be a very a positive sign if I can were to move ahead with the dot Amazon applications, which were very lawfully filed, and the government government interference came in uh, and uh, yeah, again, I'm concerned about, uh, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to do that question second. I'm going to do that. So, uh, and I'll I'll open this to the folks on the panel. At what point do we see such an explosion in uh, top level domains? that it, it becomes worthless. The idea behind more top-level domains was to give more people the ability to register a domain name. But if I have to register Blake.com, Blake.net, Blake.org, uh, Blake.biz, Blake.us, Blake uh, sucks, Blake, you know, where, where, does it, where does it stop? Why, should, why shouldn't just general intellectual property law say you can't register somebody's trademark in any a global top-level domain, rather than, as uh, Chairman Issa pointed out, extorting companies to uh, register potentially thousands of variations of uh, their domain names. Mr. Corr, and you seem eager to jump on that. Well, I think, you know, we're carrying out this experiment now with the first round of top-level domains, and we're, we're going to see what the market demand is. Uh, it was very expensive for these applicants to bid for each of these uh, so-called strings. Uh, there was a $185,000 application fee. The, the average cost when you put in the consultants and attorneys and other and the back-end technical providers, you're talking about half a million to a million dollars per application just to, before you open it. And if there's no market for this, it's, it's hard to think that those type of applicants will be there at the next round. There may be dot brand applicants. Hopefully there will be more applicants in uh, foreign letter characters, uh, Arabic and such. Uh, but the, the key thing here, and, and then there are other costs. Uh, Dot Sucks, for example, had to spend an additional $3 million to win an auction because they were one of three applicants for that. Uh, so I think the market will take care of this to some extent. Well, I see we're a not business see, opportunity we won't, for me in registering .sux. And last <laughs> thought, but we do need to, in terms of pejorative terms like Dot Sucks, there has to be some type of public interest standard. If that's allowed to proceed, uh, why wouldn't we see in the second round applications for dot wire, dot criminal, dot blows, the type of top level domain that no person or company wants to be associated with? And, and that's I, I not how the program should work. The program, the program should, be, should provide names that people want for positive reasons, not that they want to buy to protect themselves. Ms. Stark, did you want to add something? I'm running out of time quickly. I do. I just want to say that I don't think trademark owners in general are um, battling against free speech. And that's what a total prohibition of any domain names that contain an existing trademark would be. Trademarks are created out of language, and there are fair uses, and there needs to be a balance between free speech and what is intellectual property protection. But I will say that in such an expansive new world, Every brand owner of every size, my company included, is very resource challenged on how we are going to adequately protect what are valuable corporate assets that we have invested in for decades in this new world. Thank you. I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the Congresswoman from Washington, Ms. Delbene. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to all of you for being here with us today. Um, Mr. Meisner, I wanted to follow up on the opinion on Amazon's application um, for, Am for dot Amazon. It seems like it's basically been a draw at this point. Um, the opinion found there wasn't a basis for ICANN to turn down the, your application, but also found that Amazon didn't have a clear right to have its application granted. And so I wondered if you could explain for the committee the process that you went through um, and what information was made available concerning the ICANN's decision-making process for you. and. Um, kind of what comes next. Thank you very much, Ms. Delmeni. Um, it really wasn't and isn't a draw. It's a loss for us. The reason why is we are the ones who filed the application for dot Amazon and its Chinese and uh, Japanese language equivalents, and we have to date been denied. Uh, no one else filed for those. Uh, no one else has intellectual property rights to those names, uh, including the countries in that region. Those countries exerted influence over the, the government advisory committee, which then persuaded the board to deny our applications. Um, 
We followed the rules that had been developed over that three-year process, that multi-stakeholder process. It was very clear in the guidelines, which are the rules that govern the application process, that the, the name Amazon was not in the prohibited class of geographic names. There's a whole list of lists, actually, within the guidebook, a very expansive list uh, that includes things like Brazil and .br and Peru, but nowhere is Amazon included in any of these lists. And so um, that process, which had developed the list of lists, uh, just simply was ignored. Um, under pressure from these other governments and um, unfortunately, and it pays me to say so, but the U.S. government uh, ended up abstaining when they could have objected uh, to, the, to this treatment of an American company. And so what comes next now on your side? Unclear. We have uh, other options, I suppose, uh, legally, but the, uh, the main thing, it seems to me, is during this extended now, I in a transition process, ICANN should take this opportunity to make itself whole in this regard. The adoption of um, accountability reforms is coming. And those accountability reforms should not just be applied prospectively. They should be applied as if they existed today. Uh, ICANN always should have been accountable. And uh, if, if, they, if ICANN considers these, uh, the, the new uh, improved review processes that are going to be adopted and considers them being applicable from day one, then that, I think, would solve our problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Stark, I understand that part of the process for launching the new GTLDs um, that I can establish a committee on, of trademark law experts that made recommendations for stronger and more efficient protection of trademarks, and that many of their recommendations were adopted by ICANN, including a newer, faster, and cheaper procedure to take down a do domain name that's violating a trademark owner's rights. Can you compare kind of what happened there with and contrast that with kind of how things existed in the dot-com regime um, and provide any examples for the committee of instances where a domain name was taken down based on those rules? Um, I'm sorry, I don't have just an example right off the top of my mind, but um, thank you for that question because the rights protection mechanisms are, of course, of great concern to INTA and all of its members. Um, I think that the uh, new mechanism that you're talking about is the URS system. And there is one key difference with that that has made it um, maybe not the most optimal solution for trademark owners, and that is that at the end of the day, the domain name that's in question and that may be problematic is not actually reassigned to the owner at the end of that, to the trademark owner at the end of that process. So yes, there are some efficiencies to the process, but I think that the ultimate resolution can be less than ideal for a lot of brand owners. And so you will see that even though it might be more expensive and take more time, you have a lot of brand owners are still resorting to the, what's called the UDRP, the Uniform Dispute Resolution um, process, um, because that does include a transfer of the domain name at the end of the proceeding. So do you think that the, we have the right process in place, or what do you think we should do differently based on your learning now um, as we look towards you know, I would say that the process is always evolving, as we have seen um, with ICANN in general, and that while we have constantly tried to be an important voice in that multi-stakeholder community to achieve the right balance between rights protection and, um, and innovation and competition and choice and free speech, I don't know that we've totally gotten to the right place. I think that um, the IPC in particular, but as well the BC and even the Brown Registry Group within the ICANN community are continuing to think hard about these kinds of issues. And as we see new spaces um, uh, get launched and as we see new behaviors, what we can do to make sure that the right balance is achieved. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> I'm going to rec recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. And, uh, this question is for Ms. Stark, but uh, Mr. Metalitz and Mr. Zuck, if you have a different answer, would you please respond briefly? Today, U.S. companies face ever-increasing intellectual property threats as more and more websites provide access to pirated content and counterfeit goods. I would like to ask about the registrar's accreditation agreement that required new obligations for registrars when presented with evidence of copyright or trademark infringements or other illegal activities. Ms. Stark. Um, thank you very much. 
for that question. I think that um, piracy, of course, is, is really of great concern to my company in particular, but also counterfeit um, merchandise and other products, like you've talked about in the pharmaceutical world, are very important to INTA and its members. So this is uh, an issue very near and dear to our hearts. What I would say is, at a minimum, what we need to see is ICANN enforcing what already exists in the contracts. That would be who is, that would be also contract compliance if they have registrars who are not responding um, in the appropriate ways when they are notified of this type of illegal and infringing behavior, then there needs to be some teeth in the mechanisms that already exist. Um, and I think that that would be the thing we would hope to see the most. And thank you. Mr. Medalist, do you find him successful? Uh, uh, yes, I, I would just add to that, uh, the requirement that, that Ms. Stark is referring to is to take reasonable and prompt steps to investigate and respond appropriately to reports of abuse, including reports of the kind of legal, illegal activity you're talking about. That's what needs to be enforced. This is not a question of any kind of automatic takedown. It's investigating and responding appropriately. That is not happening now. And, and we don't have the transparency to even see what uh, ICANN thinks that is appropriate in this setting. Thank you. Mr. Zuck? Yes, uh, piracy is a growing concern for the app industry uh, around the world, and so I support uh, what's been said before, but I would also suggest that these new accountability measures we're putting in place is in large measure what's been missing from the universe in which we've been operating to date. And so having the ability to actually enforce some discipline upon ICANN and to enact real binding reform inside of ICANN I believe is the is is the is the key to getting the kind of uh, contractual compliance office inside ICANN that we've all been waiting for. Uh, this question is for Mr. Del Bianco. In testimony before this subcommittee last year, NTIA Administrator Strickling spoke of the importance of ensuring a stable legal environment for the IANA services. He subsequently informed the committee that while he considered the U.S. to provide such an environment that the stakeholders that are developing the transition plan are better placed to examine whether ICANN should continue to remain subject to U.S. law post-transition or not. He declined to answer whether protections need to be in place before the transition occurs to ensure that ICANN remains subject to U.S. law after completion, thereby admitting the possibility that this is negotiable. It seems to me that it is essential that ICANN and IANA function operators remain subject to U.S. law going forward and that there is no better legal environment to ensure the continued stability of these operations. But I'd like the record to reflect the opinion of you uh, concerning this and what say you? I know I threw a lot at you right there. You did, but you started by pronouncing my name perfectly, which comes from Marino to Marino. Del Bianco. No problem. No problem. In an answer I gave earlier to uh, Representative Forbes, uh, I was reflecting not only my own revised opinion, but that of the community working group, who took a look at whether ICANN's new bylaws should reflect a commitment that was made in the affirmation of commitments, a commitment to maintain its headquarters in the United States. And when you maintain headquarters or principal offices in the United States, that would mean that their legal presence includes the United States. At the Commerce hearing in the Senate in February, uh, ICANN CEO Fadi Shahadi re repeated his commitment that they would honor that. But uh, the working group did not believe that any one person's commitment would matter and that the affirmation, frankly, could be discarded by ICANN with 120 days notice. So we followed through on your question by ensuring that the bylaws of ICANN reflect that its principal offices would remain in California. And while the community might be able to approve a change to that, the board could not do it on its own. The board could not change the bylaws to remove their presence in California unless the community elected to approve that if we make it a fundamental bylaw. That's 75% of community voting members, and we have the voting ratios set up in our, in our proposal. That would mean that it would be a very popular decision to vacate the principal offices in California. It would have to have overwhelming support, 75% of the global community. Not, not easy to get. Thank you. My time has expired. The chair recognizes the Congresswoman from California, Ms. Lofgren. Well, thank you. As the chair of the California Democratic uh, Delegation, we thank you for keeping the facility in California. Um, I would like to ask unanimous consent to put in the record a letter uh, dated today 
from the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation, uh, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. I, I would note that uh, basically uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation makes the point that those who are suggesting that I can require the uh, suspension of internet domain names based on accusations of copyright or trademark infringement uh, are effectively making the same proposal that was the centerpiece of the Stop Online Piracy Act, otherwise known as SOPA, that was dropped by this committee after millions of people melted the phone lines here in, in the Congress, and that uh, at that time, 83 internet engineers uh, warned that we cannot have a free and open internet and lets its naming and routing system sits above the political concerns and objectives of any one industry or uh, a company, and that uh, the only way a domain name registrar can address copyright infringement accusations uh, is by suspending its domain name and goes on with other issues. Our, my colleague, Mr. Farenthold, was uh, talking about the uh, contractual obligations uh, that ICON has, but one of the things I believe he did not mention that I think is key is that the registrars are required to take an action where there's a court order or an administrative finding not based on mere allegations of wrongdoing. And I think that's an essential element that has been missing here in this uh, discussion. I think, you know, we're still in the brave new world of the Internet, and one of the things that I think is interesting is whose law applies where. And listening, uh, Mr. Horton and Mr. Medelitz, to your uh, testimony, you know, talking about websites that are selling pharmaceuticals, you know, whose law applies? I and mean, if you go to a chemist in Britain and you buy aspirin, you can get aspirin with codeine over the counter. You can't get that in the United States. If you go to Mexico, you can buy antibiotics over the counter. You certainly can't do that here, but you can't buy Sudafed in Mexico, even though you can do that here. So I noticed, Mr. Horton, that uh, your redress was really to U.S. sites as well as you, uh, Mr. Metalis, even though the websites complained of were really apparently operating in other countries and so far as I know, complying with the laws of those uh, countries. For example, the Romania server that you mentioned, Mr. Medelitz, I, I'm not an expert on Romanian copyright law, but I believe they do have a right to make private copies for personal use or for qu what's called normal familial groups that would probably be infringement here in the United States. So whose law applies? I'll go first. Um, <clears throat> Congresswoman Lofgren, um, that's absolutely incorrect. Uh, first of all, as to your point about a court order, I can have stated in writing that a court order is not required in order for a registrar to take voluntary action and suspend the domain name. Uh, the rogue internet pharmacies that we notify registrars about are not operating legally anywhere. There is not a single country in the world in which it's uh, lawful to sell prescription drugs without a prescription, uh, to practice pharmacy without a pharmacy license, or to violate that country's drug safety laws. Every single domain name that we notify a registrar about is operating illegally everywhere it targets. And most of this is common sense. This is very easily uh, verifiable on the face of the website, like the heroin website uh, that I mentioned. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. If I can respond on the yeah. copyright issue. Uh, first of all, I, I don't have the EFF letter, but I, uh, as you read it... To I me, just got it. So. I, I don't think anybody on this panel is advocating what, what that letter says. We're advocating enforcement of a provision that says registrar shall take reasonable and prompt steps to investigate and respond appropriately to any reports of abuse. It doesn't, there's nothing in here about automatic takedown or without any verification. So that, that's point one. Uh, number two, on the applicable law, I think actually this is less of a problem in the copyright area than in almost any other area because we have a, a much clearer international standard. 170 countries belong to the Berne Convention. Approximately the same number of countries belong to the World Trade Organization. Well, if I may interrupt, in Britain, for example, they, uh, they don't have a First Amendment, and they broadly constrain what we would consider to be inviolable free speech. They outlaw some of what their press does. That would not 
uh, being yes, but accepted no, here in the United States. There's, there's, there's in copyright and in trademark as well. There is much more of a uniform international norm than there is on free speech issues or on any of these other issues. Well, so I, it's, it's, my time it's not is a up, and, I, but and Mr. Johnson, I want to respect his time. I will pursue this further after the hearing, and I think that there are some things that need to be clarified. And I thank the chairman for his indulgence. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Congressman Johnson. Thank you. I'd like for you to continue your comments. Yeah, uh, yes, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. My, my only other point was, I mean, the example about private copying under Romanian law, this is not an issue of private copying. The, the itemvn.com website that we cite in our testimony uh, is streaming and, and allowing downloads of uh, music that hasn't been released yet uh, and before it's released, it's available on that site without any license. So this is not private copying at all. So what we're really talking about is the um, uh, ICANN Government Advisory Committee enforcing the rules that the stakeholders have uh, agreed to in the four-year process that it took to come up with this uh, applicant guidebook. And you're just wanting uh, enforcement of the rules. Essentially, that's, that's right, Mr. Johnson. Th this is a contract that we're talking about here that was entered into between ICANN and all of these registrars. It, it was a multi-year process to develop this contract, but it's, it's down on paper now. Let's make sure that it's enforced and that we understand what the, what the ground rules are. And Mr. Uh, Meissner, you complain of uh, Amazon's adherence to the rules in applying for a uh, GLTD, GTLD, um, which incorporated your very name that you have a trademark on, though it may denote some geographic area, uh, that geographic area or that geographic name was not among the names that were set forth in the applicant guidebook which were to be prohibited from being assigned. And uh, so you applied for dot .amazon yes, sir. And, uh, and the countries of Brazil and Peru through which the Amazon River runs uh, objected. I don't know what the basis of their objection was, but apparently your view would be that it was uh, not, there was no basis in the rules to object uh, based on geography. And so uh, you engaged in negotiations with those two governments and uh, nothing happened. And so when it went to a decision, uh, the uh, ICANN uh, Government Advisory Committee uh, recommended uh, disapproval or denied your approval. What, and, and your contention is that there's no basis in the rules for that denial. Uh, what is your remedy? Mr. Johnson, thank you so much. That was a perfect summary of our circumstance. Uh, the remedy, frankly, is to ensure that NTIA ensures well, outside of the NTIA uh, adherence to its right. uh, guidebook, how can you enforce, or uh, is there some kind of independent review? Because, I mean, if, you, if you're going to have some accountability and some reliability and transparency and a, a rule of law, which is what the guidebook represents, a rule of law, uh, there can be disputes about the meaning and intent of the rules, and so you'd have to have some body to uh, uh, make a uh, fair and impartial decision uh, based on the uh, clear language of the guidebook. What remedy exists uh, to, uh, to enable Amazon to uh, have a day in court, if you would? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. There's not a good remedy right now within ICANN. One of the proposed reforms for ICANN accountability would establish a stronger independent review process within the body. And so that process presumably would have allowed us to have our day in court without the government influence that occurred. Um, we're just afraid because, frankly, there is very strong bipartisan support in the United States, also support between Congress and the administration, that the internet should remain free of government me, control. And right me, now it's not. Let me stop you right there and ask Mr. Woodcock, why did the U.S. abstain from 
uh, uh, weighing in on the decision as to Amazon's uh, uh, registration of that name? Fundamentally, this is an issue that I have no particular expertise on because Does my area know? is numbers. Excuse me. Does anybody know why? Can anybody say why? Was it a procedural advantage that the U.S. would retain from abstaining? Anybody know? Yes, Mr. Zuck. I, I guess I don't know for sure what their motivations were, but I continue to believe that the IANA contract itself is a cumbersome and unwieldy form of accountability and that the U.S. finds itself in a very difficult position to exercise its will over ICANN in that way. And the other ways that it can exercise its will is through the GAC, through the international organizations in which it participates. But I think the replacement of that, of that mechanism accountability with real accountability of the community is, is the key going forward. And Mr. Johnson, I wasn't in the room, none of us were in the, in the GAC room when they made the decision whether to block the dot Amazon. So you can chalk it up to perhaps it's politics, maybe it was substantive, but more than likely it's about the politics that goes on as nations decide how to support or oppose each other. But after that happened, the ICANN board had the opportunity to respectfully say, we don't agree with your advice. And the board itself has that opportunity. In today's world, if we don't like the decision of the board, it's incredibly expensive and only a few parties would have standing to be able to challenge that board decision and to have it be reviewed by an independent panel. And if that panel came back and said the board was wrong, the board could still ignore the panel. These are why the reforms we've described would turn that upside down so that aggrieved parties could appeal. And if the community, 75% of us agreed, ICANN would pay the legal fees. And if the panel came back and said your decision was wrong, the board would have to do it over. Thank you. Thank you. I now ask unanimous consent that a statement by the, uh, Mr. Collins be placed in the record. And I'm just going to be a very quick follow-up as a close. Uh, in the fiscal year 2016, Commerce Justice State uh, language has been inserted for a second year, it was in last year, and it prohibits uh, NTIA from using funds to relinquish IANA function. In other words, until the end of the fiscal year 2016, uh, this transition would not be allowed to go forward. Uh, does anyone see that as uh, anything other than the minimum that we should do within uh, Congress's authority? In other words, slow down this process. It's not a renewal. It simply uh, allows them not to relinquish. Yes, sir. Uh, again, I think that there's a huge distinction to be made between the names community and the protocols and numbers community. Protocols and numbers community are peers, if you will, with ICANN. They develop policy globally through the multi-stakeholder process, and the result of that policy is merely copied over through the, I the IANA process. Sure, no, I, under I understand that, yeah, that we don't look, need to numbers resolve just fine, and nobody knows that I'm 143, 196, et cetera. Uh, the reality, though, is that the governance is a package deal, wouldn't you say? That, that, that trying to separate them would create a greater bureaucracy. Uh, I, I disagree, respectfully. Um, the three are completely separate. They're tough reforms we're trying to oppose upon them. So I do think we should keep them together. I think the Commerce Department will make a responsible extension of the IANA contract. And then what Congress does with respect to the rider all of which are moving parts that have to overlay. And that chart I had up earlier showed that possibly the earliest is next spring of 2016. Right. It might well likely leak into much later in 2016. And yet, commerce needs to have enough leeway to spend the resources necessary to answer your questions and to make sure that the stress tests have been applied to make sure that their conditions have been met. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Meisner, uh, the administration abstained from, uh, from a weighing in. Do you believe that they should have weighed in on this issue rather than leaving it as it ended up? Yes, they should have maintained their opposition to this treatment of Amazon. They initially were supportive, uh, but uh, two years ago I met with the, uh, the relevant leaders of both uh, NTIA and state and they told us that they were going to abstain. We objected both on uh, our private interests but also on the, the, uh, the precedent that it would set for the multi-stakeholder model in the U.S. Uh, support of that model, its commitment to it, right. and um, we were disappointed for sure. And ICANN, 
as I understand it, had the ability not to issue the name, period, simply to take it back and say it was a big mistake, we're not going to have a dot Amazon. Isn't that right? Well, that, that would have been an abrogation of the multi-stakeholder process, which came up with that very definitive list of lists of names on which Amazon was not included. And so you know, not George Carlin had seven names he, he used on television only to find out it, it locked him out of television. Isn't it possible that, or isn't it prudent, that even when names bubble up through a multi-stakeholder process, that when when down the road you discover, like the first day of battle, you discover that your battle plan had flaws in it because the enemy found them, Isn't, shouldn't there be a process to go back through that loop and say, is it really necessary to uh, have dot this is stupid? Well, certainly we're looking for an accountability process to be adopted so that there can be uh, you know, strong accountability for the organization, but we have something like 1,600 trademarks worldwide that incorporate Amazon in 149 different countries worldwide, including in Brazil and Peru. Those are protected trademarks. That's our global brand. It's our core uh, business brand. And so we feel very uh, uh, slighted by uh, the, the participants in the, the GAC who decided that uh, some geopolitical interest simply trumped our IPR. It is interesting that uh in over 200 years of this nation, uh, and obviously longer than that ago that the Amazon River was named, uh, nobody seemed to have come up and named their company Amazon, and yet you do it, and next thing you know, it's a great name for the whole world to have in a dot Amazon. Let me just close with a question. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. If I might uh, just ask Mr. one Gentleman, question of either. Of course. Is it a fact that the name dot Amazon is still available to a different uh, registrant? It could be, and that's a serious concern of ours, that this could come up in a subsequent round and then be available to someone else who might have obtained that name, and then we would be in a very difficult position to try to protect our IPR worldwide. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great, great question. Um, earlier, I, uh, I named some other sites that end in .com. And I just want yes or no's because I think these two can be good yes or no's. Isn't it true that the most desirable ending by far is .com for almost anybody who wants it? It's the first choice of every registrant. Is that correct? Anyone disagree with that? Yes, Mr. Corwin. Well, uh, representing a, a trade group of domain investors uh, which carefully watches what websites uh, what market value uh, is placed on websites, dot-com domains, short, non-infringing dictionary words at dot-com continue to command the highest price in the marketplace. That doesn't mean that'll last forever, that there won't be other new TLDs which challenge that dominance down the road, but in today's marketplace, uh, a good, short, non-infringing name at dot-com is a very valuable... Right. And dot-com dot sell first. If people go to find something, they go to, I use GoDaddy, but you can go to any of them. Well, they put a name in, and if, the, if dot .com is available, that's the one they take. It's even the default on many of them. And in third. fact, even individuals and companies that have acquired new TLDs, in many cases, that new domain, when you type it in, it redirects you and you wind up at their older dot .com website. So uh, I'm not saying... I think as dot the opposite of whitehouse.com, which takes you to all kinds of non.com sites. Yes, don't send your school child to whitehouse.com. Uh, I think as, as dot brands enter the market, big corporations uh, advertising at uh, dot company, the consumer will start to be educated to think more about the right of the dot. But uh, we remain primarily in a dot com world today. Okay, uh, and I'll, I'll get to you but quickly, but. Uh, Look, when Network Solutions had a monopoly, when it was one place, they, uh, they made a lot of money selling these things at, you know, less than $15, right? I have a, a basic question. If we assume for a moment that the charter of ICANN is or should be the interest of commerce, in other words, a fiduciary obligation to promote commerce, not to enrich themselves or even enrich people who sell the names, then is there any real excuse to have a $2,500 price tag on any, absolutely any name at all? In other words, first come, first serve, 
uh, if you want a name, why would, does that name need to rise above the 10 bucks that dot coms are being sold for every day? Well, I, I paid more or less the, the $10 when I bought DEI.com years ago. This is a, I think the price was slightly higher when, it, uh, when uh, Network Solutions had it, but it was still de minimis. I, I feel like we, you know, uh, enter into dangerous waters and we start talking about trying to control prices in that way. And, and I didn't ask. And I some, didn't ask about controlling prices. I, I understand. I, asked, I guess I'm saying that. Dot no, no, but no, no. Please hear the question one more time. If if the entity I can has an obligation in its charter, does or should have, that says it exists to make that product available at the lowest possible price. Its process of putting those names out, for example, no exclusives, sells, auctions don't buy exclusive rights, they three people buy it. So when I talk about competition gets you a, a appropriate price and a monopoly gets you a monopolistic price, I understand you're saying we shouldn't be fixing prices, but we have an entity that has dot sucks and is using its monopolistic power to extort money. My question is, if we assume that I can't exist for the public benefit, whether it's Amazon and your fight or any of them, and if there were fair competition, pe meaning people wanting to get these out there and nobody being able to camp on them unless they pay the fee and own it themselves, obviously you'd have a reselling market. But in the primary original sale market, is there any reason, cost-wise, that these names have to cost more than $10 a year? Yeah, I mean, cost-wise, I don't know, but if, it, if the market will bear that amount of money, it'll show up in the secondary market anyway. WallStreet.com sold for a million dollars. So, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, whether it happens at the outset or in the secondary market, is going to be a function of whether there's demand for that name. Yes, Mr. Corwin. Yeah, it really depends on the specific uh, top-level domain. As I said, there, there was substantial upfront investment to apply for each one. Let me give an example. Now, there was substantial upfront to apply because that was the model ICANN was using. I think if, it's a, if it gives positive value to the domain registrant and they believe it's worth it, and they believe it's worth it, and there may be other costs as well. The American Bankers Association and the Financial Roundtable applied for and they're getting dot bank. That's only open to regulated financial institutions. They perceive value in that because it will be a tool for preventing phishing and other financial scams that are carried out through incumbent TLDs. And that validation process and other security measures associated with the top level domain can justify a higher price to the regions. Okay. But you have to look at each case, but we don't want people being coerced to buy domains at, at much higher than, uh, at prices they would never pay uh, if they didn't feel that if someone else gets that name, it's going to cause them reputational harm. Well, there do seem to be two prices, the price when there's competition and the price when there's extortion. I'm going to go to Mr. Collins, and I'll, uh, unless, but I'll go quickly to you, ma'am. Go ahead, Ms. Stark. So I wanted to just address the principle underlying your question, Chairman Issa which is, is it there a responsibility to promote commerce and competition, and I think by extension then innovation. And what I would say about the dot sex example is there are just over 36,000 trademarks in the trademark clearinghouse today. If each of those brand owners take their set of marks that they have in that clearinghouse and register them in the dot sex space for the $2,499 it costs, that's $90 million a year, because you have to renew those names each year. So it's $90 million. And I think that those costs ultimately, as with any business, right, get passed on to the consumer. So when you break it down at its heart, this turns out to be a tax on businesses and on innovation and on consumers. I certainly agree. It couldn't have been said better. Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, I think this is, uh, interesting to see the the results and and also the discussion of ICANN because the transition of ICANN and the termination of uh, the INA contract uh, those are the two main issues. Uh, you know, first, should we terminate that contract? The second, are we ready at this moment to terminate that contract? The committee 
a while back last year actually held a uh, explored the first question in previous hearings. So my question in my line of thought is going to focus on the second. Um, but based on the evidence I've seen, and I want to ask you now, since Mr. Chairman, to enter into the record, there's a laundry list of recent ICANN failures that should uh, really call. Without objection, the laundry list is placed in the record. Thank you. That should uh, really call. Without objection, the laundry list is placed in the record. Thank you. And my wife's part is took out, so it's just there. It's just mine. I believe ICANN is engaged in a pattern of behavior that indicates their lack of commitment to follow through on their contractual obligations uh, that exist today. A multi-stakeholder model is effective when the community agreements are respected and enforced and when the administrator uh, ICANN takes seriously their responsibilities to live up to the commitments they've made. I'm concerned about the lack of accountability, transparency I've observed on the part of ICANN. In fact, it's probably uh, like an old commercial that you've seen on TV, the cheese it commercial. I just don't think they're mature enough ready to be baked into a system. So I think uh, into a cracker. This is a part that just bothers me because it just doesn't seem to be the understanding of the concern that most of us have uh, and has been discussed here today. So a couple of questions I want to start with. Uh, Ms. Stark, the first is in 2011 you told Congress that the first round of new GTLDs would cost the business community conservatively $12 million in defensive registration fees. Uh, some claim that that number was an overstatement, was it? No. I would, I would actually say that for some companies that are really interested in protecting a, a whole host of brands, the numbers could be even worse. In 2011, I had noted that a large corporation might look to register maybe 300 defensive names in what was then anticipated to be about 400 spaces. And we averaged that out at just the cost of $100 a name, right? That's how we got to that $12 million. Well, I think the cost today remain unknown. We haven't even delegated maybe half of the names into the space now. But you're not looking at 400 names any longer. You're looking at over 1,300 new spaces. And from our calculations, the average sunrise registration in the spaces that have gone forward is more like in the $300, $350 range when you average it across all those spaces. So that, again, is triple what we were talking about in 2011. And then if you look at this dot sucks example that we've been discussing throughout today, you're talking about for a single mark, it costing $2,499 a year. And like I said, if you, re if the brand owners register all the marks that they've put into that clearinghouse, that's a cost to business of $90 million a year. It's, a, it's extraordinary. It, it, it is. I want to stay right here with just one more question with you, and it's a concern that uh, rogue website operators are increasingly engaging in the domain hopping. Uh, switching from one TLD to another to maintain their brand. For example, there are several sites that trade on the Pirate Bay's name, uh, even though the site's operator have been convicted of criminal copyright infringement. Some of these sites are existing TLDs, the PirateBay.com, ThePirateBay.com, and or .org, and others with new GTLDs. Do you think it's fair that rights owners or law enforcement take action against one domain only to have the same problem arise uh, you know, basically trading on the same name with a different TLD. So I think that that is an extraordinary challenge um, for companies like mine, and I very much appreciate you raising it. Um, we are always looking for ways in which to um, more efficiently kind of address these problems without having to tackle people as they hop around the world and, and hop around the Internet from name to name to name. I don't know that I have a solution to that, but I do think that it really creates a resource challenge when what we are trying to do is get out legitimate content to people and, and, and sort of spur innovation and productivity in that same internet world, and what they are trying to do is simply steal it. Well, and I think this is a, it's something that's very important because you're actually, it's, it's sort of the, the tree here. We're following, you know, this out, and I think that's, you know, you can do it in other cases, criminal cases, you can do it in others, but especially in this kind of case where you've had this blatant kind of topping around that is just uh, uh, against, and so I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Medlitz, uh how important is it for accuracy and integrity of the who is database to the function of accountability and the rule of law to the online ecosystem, and also who or how do you do these uh, issues intersect with the public interest commitment, the registrar accreditation agreement, and the other ICANN standards of online accountability? Uh, thank you for that question. Who is is extremely important. It's, uh, it's, it's a key um, element of accountability and transparency to know who you're dealing with online. 
I can was given stewardship of this database 15 years ago, back in the Monopoly days, when, right after the Monopoly days that the chairman was referring to, and it has not fared well during that period. It's less accessible at, and it's certainly less accurate, apparently less accurate now than it was then. And we have a problem now that 20 percent of the registrations in the GTLDs are registered to proxy services. So you, you, it doesn't really, you, it just puts a, a barrier between you and finding out who you're dealing with online. And I think your, your previous question to Ms. Stark was very well put, be, and, and we have two problems there. One is we have some legacy uh, registries such as .org. So even after oldpiratebay.org was brought to their attention, and Pirate Bay has been the subject of uh, orders in many countries, the people who ran it have gone to jail in Sweden for copyright infringement. Uh, even after that, .org would not take any action, the, the operators of that registry. But then we also have a problem with the country code top-level domains, the two-letter domains, right. that ICANN has no control over. And some of them have been quite cooperative, but some have not. So this is a, another frontier that we still need to, to deal with in this effort to try to enforce our copyrights. Well, and I think that's something the chairman and I have, have worked on a great deal, and it, it, because if, if we continue this hopping around, we continue this, this non-transparency and this non-accountability, then we're simply set in ways that, that are affecting business, it is affecting uh, really that ingenuity, that, that spirit that we're trying to, to incorporate, and especially when it comes to just blatant stealing. And, and copyright infringement, which is, let's just call it what it is. So I appreciate that. I know uh, Amazon is, you've had an amazing story with ICANN and the problems there and could go into that. So I wanted to recognize that fact that I've seen that. And for all of us here, this is just, again, I, I think it's just a, an example that ICANN, there's the problems here and it's not ready. And I think that's the thing we go back to. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to close with a question. Uh, it's somewhat rhetorical, but I'll let you weigh in. If, uh, you want to, and it's similar to what Mr. Zook and I had sort of a back and forth on. ICANN is a California registered nonprofit. Now, nonprofits, even though they pay their CEO millions of dollars, nonprofits can only be nonprofits if they, in fact, exist for a public benefit. So, ICANN, contrary to Mr. Zook and I's back and forth, has an obligation for service. And I'm, I'm of the opinion that in a number of examples we've seen here today, including how they oversee, if you will, the multi-stakeholder process, they seem to have lost track of that. And certainly when you see that a relatively de minimis amount of money, it cost me less than $10 to get ISA.cc, which happens to be an international, but it came through the process of you buy it online and a number of others. Most times when you want a name, if it's available, it costs you $10 or less. But when in fact it is a name that exists for the purpose of causing you to buy it in defense, it has an extortionary price. My closing comments, and I'll let anyone weigh in that wants to, is doesn't Congress have an obligation, along with the state of California, I might say, to look at ICANN and say, you know, ICANN's making a ton of money. They seem to be in the operation of making a ton of money. It looks like in the case of Dot Sucks that they simply wanted to recover a $900,000 million IOU from a company that had failed to meet its earlier commitments. And this deal was a way to do it with an extra incentive to clear up an old balance. If somebody disagrees, I'd love to hear it. If you agree, briefly, and then we'll call it a day. Yes. At 17 years old, ICANN is really just a nascent institution. It's an evolving institution in the most rapidly changing industry the world has ever seen. So guess what? Every year, every week, we're going to have new problems, just like the ones that you've adequately described. And when these problems come up, we can't anticipate to say that uh, we can check the box to say they've solved all the problems that they have and they've solved all the problems that will ever be in order to say, are they ready? What we really need to say is that when they make bad decisions or implement good decisions poorly, we've got to be able to hold them to account, challenge their bad decisions like this decision on the million dollar fee to the dot sucks. We ought to be able to challenge it, to know about it, and if they don't listen to what the community believes, we fire the entire board and start with a new board under the same public service principles. Mr. Corwin. As a public benefit corporation, they certainly have an obligation to act in the public interest. And, and uh, 
there has been a, a tremendous amount of money generated by the new top-level domain program, about a third of a billion dollars in application fees alone. There's something going on right now that... Well, of course, uh, ultimately, the, the auction process, yes. that's not serving the public interest, that's making them money. The public well, interest is served when a company like Amazon gets value, and, and I'll put it in a term that hopefully you'll all agree with. Horses running alone run slower than a horse with a jockey on it. But a horse with a 500-pound jockey doesn't run at all. We, in fact, have a phenomenal horse. The, the naming system is what makes a string of first four and now six sequential or series of numbers actually be usable by the public. That's the jockey that's making this enterprise work. When I type fox, dot, fox for fox.com, I, I, I get what I want in most cases. It works where numbers would never do that. But if I simply put hundreds or thousands of $10 to $2,500 purchases on the back of an enterprise, I put a 500-pound jockey on that enterprise. As you said so well, Ms. Stark, I'm taxing an enterprise. That public benefit corporation has an obligation to these companies. They have an obligation to the stakeholder. The real stakeholder is commerce. It's not their enrichment in fees and, and a, a new gr set of profiteers that simply are in the business of hijacking the system and causing other enterprises to pay for effectively a heavier jockey. I think and we're going to have to issue, end it after this. Yeah, I think part of the issue is that there's a certain degree of complexity and unwieldiness to the current system. The uh, accountability measures are there to NTIA, but it's a three-party system where the services that I can provide are provided to the community, but we rely on NTIA to provide the discipline to ICANN, making ICANN directly responsible to the industry so that industry can provide its own self-governance is something I think everyone on this panel yeah. can probably agree to. Thank you, and, and this will be the very last comment because it is time to go. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could just add the perspective of someone who has followed ICANN very closely over the past 15 years and had many opportunities to share my perspectives with this subcommittee, which I really appreciate. This ICANN is an experiment, and, and experiments uh, don't always work out neatly, and they don't always work out uh, effectively at a, at a particular snapshot. I think if you take the longer view, many of the problems we're talking about here are, are show progress. This, these, contra these contracts that ICANN is not yet enforcing, they didn't even have these contracts until two years ago. And, and similarly on who is, they have a, they're taking on the problem of proxy registrations. I don't know if they'll be able to deal with it effectively, but they weren't even taking it on a few years ago. So I think we have to look at the bigger picture to see, uh, you're absolutely right, that as a public benefit corporation, ICANN needs to serve the public interest. And I think the oversight of this subcommittee is an important factor, and continued oversight uh, will be an important factor in making sure they do so. Thank you. And this concludes today's hearing. I want to thank all of my witnesses, our witnesses today. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit.